the nature of prayer. In the lecture on mysticism, we spoke of the particular form of inner withdrawal which appeared in the Middle Ages from the time of Meister Eckhart to that of Angelus Silesius. Its particular characteristic is that mystics attempt to free themselves of all the experiences stimulated in them by the outer world, so that when this has happened they will encounter a different world, one that is, of course, always there, but which is outshone by the overpowering effects from outside. To start with, this inner world, which shines with such a weak light that it can easily be overlooked, is called, therefore, a small spark. But they are sure that this inconspicuous little spark of their soul experiences can be fanned into a powerful flame, which will illuminate the sources and foundations of existence. In other words, which will lead them along the paths of the soul to the knowledge of their own origin, which can, be call, which can indeed be called inspired knowledge. In the course of the lecture we heard that the medieval mystics presumed that this small spark had to grow by itself unchanged. In contrast to this, we emphasized that modern spiritual research calls for conscious development of these soul forces, a development based on the will, so that seekers will attain to higher forms of cognition, which we called imaginative, inspirational, and intuitive knowledge. So, this medieval mystical withdrawal presented itself to us as a starting point toward genuine higher spiritual research, which, although it begins its search of the spirit by developing the inner life, yet through taking its own independent way comes forth from the inner life and is led to the sources and foundations of all existence, to where our own soul belongs. The mysticism of the Middle Ages, then, was a kind of first step to real spiritual research. If we have the ability to immerse ourselves in the inner fervor of Meister Eckhart and to recognize the immeasurable force of the spiritual knowledge Johannes Tauler received through mystical devotion, if we appreciate how deeply Valentin Weigel or Jakob Burma were led later on to the secrets of existence, through all that they acquired from this kind of mystical devotion, though they certainly advanced beyond it, if we understand how the transformation wrought in Angelus Silesius precisely by way of such mystical devotion, and that he became capable not only of gaining illuminating insights into the great laws of the spiritual world order, but of giving heartwarmingly beautiful expression in his writings to the world's secrets, If we recognize all this, we shall appreciate the power and depth of this medieval mysticism and what an infinite amount of help there is in this mysticism for those who themselves are intent on going the ways of spiritual research. Medieval mysticism can therefore be regarded, particularly in the light of last week's lecture, as a wonderful and comprehensive preparatory schooling for spiritual scientific research. And how could it be otherwise? After all, the aim of the spiritual researcher is to develop, by way of his own inner forces, the little spark of which the mystics speak. The only difference between them is that the mystics believed that they could surrender themselves with quiet devotion to the small spark, and that it would come to shine ever more brightly of its own accord. Whereas the spiritual researcher is convinced that we must use our capacities and forces placed by the wisdom of the world in the service of our will to enkindle the spark to a brighter flame. If then the mystic frame of mind is a good preparation for a spiritual investigation, in fact, pointing altogether in that direction, there is, on the other hand, a preparatory step to mystical devotion, an activity of soul that in its true nature is called prayer, 
and this is what we shall be looking into more closely today. Just as mystics become capable of practicing looking inward because they have, to a certain extent, perhaps unconsciously, acquired the right mood by developing themselves, anyone else who wants to work their way along paths that can lead to this mystical devotion will find genuine prayer to be a first step. During recent centuries, the nature of prayer has been misunderstood in all sorts of ways by one or another spiritual movement. Therefore, it will not be easy to get to a true understanding of it. If, however, we bear in mind that recent centuries have been especially marked by the emergence of egoistic spiritual trends, which have led, laid hold of wide circles of people, we shall not be surprised that prayer has been dragged down to the level of egoistic desire. We could go as far as to say that prayer can hardly be more utterly misunderstood than when it is filled with some form of egoism. In this lecture we shall try to study prayer absolutely independently of any sectarian or other influences and entirely in the light of spiritual science. As a first indication, we might say that while the mystic presupposes that he will find in his soul some kind of little spark which his mystical devotion will make to shine ever more brightly, prayer is intended to engender the spark, the person's very own soul force. And prayer, from whatever presuppositions it proceeds, proves its effectiveness precisely by either stirring the soul to discover the little spark, if it is there, gleaming but hidden, or to kindle it in the first place. If we want to investigate the nature of prayer and our need to pray, we shall have to look at a characterization of the soul in depth, bearing in mind the words of the ancient Greek sage Heraclitus, quoted in an earlier lecture, which apply here par excellence. Quote, Never will you find the boundaries of the soul, by whatever paths you search, so all-embracing are the soul's secrets. Close quote. And when, as we pray, we are at first merely going in search of the soul's secrets, the tender feelings stirred by prayer can give even the simplest person some inkling of the infinite expanses of the life of the soul. We have to come to realize that the soul is involved in a process of living evolution, and it not only comes from the past and progresses into the future, but at every moment of its life in the present it contains something of the past, and even, in a way, of the future. The effects of the past and the effects coming toward us as though from the future reach into the now, especially where our soul's life is concerned. It will seem to anyone who looks more deeply into the life of the soul that two streams, one from the past and one from the future, are continually meeting there. It might seem strange if, in any other sphere of life, people were to talk of future events rushing toward them, for it is easy to say that what is going to happen in the future obviously has not happened yet. Therefore we cannot say that it is, quote, rushing toward us, close quote. On the other hand, it is easy enough to say we are influenced by the past. Who could deny that our energy or idleness of yesterday has some effect on us today? But we ought not to deny the reality of the future either, for we can observe in our soul itself the intrusion of future events, although they have not yet happened. For is there not such a thing as fear of something which could happen tomorrow? Is there not a sort of feeling that we put out toward a future that is still unknown to us? Whenever the soul experiences fear or anxiety, it shows by the reality of its feelings that it is reckoning not only with the past, but is keenly reckoning with something hastening toward it from the future. These are simply a few pointers. But if you want to take the measure of the soul, you will find numerous examples of the living reality of the future to contradict the abstract logic of the intellect, 
telling us that since the future does not yet exist, it can, no, it can have no influence on the present. Thus, there are two streams, one from the past and one from the future, which come together in the soul. Will any and everyone who observes themselves deny that? and produce a kind of whirlpool comparable to the confluence of two rivers. Close observation shows that the effects of the impressions left on us by past experience have made the soul what it is. We are the result of the way we have applied our experiences of the past. We bear within ourselves the legacy of our past doing, feeling, and thinking. If we look back over these past experiences, especially those in which we played an active part, we shall very often be impelled to judge ourselves. We shall realize that we are capable, from our present standpoint, of not approving of every result, but of disagreeing with some of our past actions, of even being ashamed of them. If we now look at our present alongside our past, We shall have the sneaking feeling that within us there is something far richer and significant than what we have made of ourselves through our individual powers. For if there were not something that extended beyond our conscious selves, we should be unable to reproach ourselves or even to know ourselves. We must admit that we have within ourselves something that surpasses anything we have made use of in ourselves up to now. If we transform this realization into a feeling, we shall be able to look back at all we know as our past actions and experiences, and we shall be able to compare these memories with something in us that is greater than all these, something that wants to work its way out and teach us to come face to face with ourselves and to judge ourselves from the standpoint of the present. We shall, in fact, if we look at the stream flowing into us from the past, get an inkling of something that extends beyond ourselves. And this intimation of there being something greater than our, within ourselves is the first awakening of God within us, a feeling that something is living in us that is greater than everything within the present scope of our own will. And thus we are led to look beyond our limited ego toward a divine spiritual ego. This is the outcome of a contemplation of the past transformed into perceptive feeling. What, then, does the stream from the future say to us in terms of perceptive feeling? It speaks to us even more clearly and emphatically, for it speaks not of remorse and shame, but of feelings of fear and anxiety, of hope and joy. And as the relevant events have not yet occurred, we can more easily transform the idea into a feeling than we could in the other case. The soul does it of itself. To the soul the future feels real enough, and therefore it feels to us though, as though our feelings were coming from an unknown stream that can bring us one thing or another. If we can transform into the right feelings, what will surely be coming to us from the dark womb of the future, our response from out of our world of feelings will be that our soul lights up ever again in experiencing these events. We feel that the soul is capable of becoming richer and more comprehensive. We feel right now in the present that the soul will be able to hold a much greater content than now. We do already, in fact, have to feel related to what is approaching from the future. We have to be a match for all that the future may hold. If we observe in this way how past and future flow into the present, we see the intimation the soul has of growing beyond itself. We shall then see why it is that when, on looking back into the past, the soul becomes aware of significant experiences playing in and feels no match for them. It responds with a feeling of reverence for the divine force gazing in at us from the past. And this reverence toward a divine force that is beyond our conscious grasp evokes one of the prayerful moods, for there are two, the one that brings the soul into an intimate relationship with God. 
For if the soul surrenders itself in innermost calm to the feelings engendered by the past, it will begin to wish that the forces greater than itself, which it left unused and did not permeate with its ego, might now become a present reality. The soul could say to itself, quote, If this greater force were within me, I would be a different person. But it was not alive and present in me. Because this divine force of which I have an intimation was not part of my inner life, I failed to make of myself something of which I could wholly approve. Close quote. Having come to this realization, a mood arises in the soul, making it say, quote, How can I acquire the power which has, although unknown to me, lived in all my deeds and experiences? Close quote. Out of this mood, whether expressed by a feeling, a word, or an idea, comes the prayer directed to the past. This is one of the devotional paths we can follow in seeking for the divine. We turn in a different mood to the light that shines for us out of the stream coming from the unknown future. As we have just seen, when we look back over the past, we realize that although we sense a divine element shining into us, we have not utilized all the forces it could have made available to us, and it is our shortcoming which make us unequal to this divine gleam that leads to the mood of the prayer directed to the past. What then is the influence coming from the future that in a similar way impedes our ascent to the spirit? We need only think of the feelings of fear and anxiety that gnaw at our soul life in face of the unknown future. Is there a force that can give us a sense of security in this situation? Yes, there is. It is what we may call a feeling of humble dedication to whatever comes to us out of the dark womb of the future. But this feeling will be effective only if it becomes a mood of prayer. Let us avoid misunderstanding. We are not singing the praises of any kind of submissiveness. We are describing a definite form of it, submission in the face of whatever the future may bring. Those who harbor anxiety and fear for what the future might bring hinder their development, hamper the free unfolding of their soul forces. In fact, nothing obstructs this development more than fear and anxiety in face of the unknown future. However, the results of submitting reverently to the future can only be judged by experience. What does this submission to future events signify? Ideally, it would mean saying to oneself, quote, whatever is coming my way, whether it be in the next hour or tomorrow, it is not going to be altered by any amount of fear and anxiety, because right now I do not know what is coming. I will therefore await it with complete inner calm, without the slightest emotional tremor. Close quote. All those who can meet the future in this relaxed and humble way, without losing any of their energy in the process, will be able to apply their soul forces in the most intense and free manner. It is as though one hindrance after another were to fall away as the soul is filled more and more strongly by this feeling of openness toward approaching events. This feeling, however, neither comes of itself nor comes by our being commanded to feel it. It is the result of what we can call the other prayerful mood, the one directed toward the future and its wisdom-filled course of events. To dedicate ourselves to this divine wisdom means that we call up again and again the thought, feeling and soul impulse that what will come has to come and that it will in some way have its good effects. To call forth this frame of mind and to give it expression in words, feelings and ideas, this is the second prayerful mood, the mood of humble submission. It is from these moods of soul that we have to get the impetus for what we call prayer. For these urges are in our own souls, and fundamentally speaking, a mood of prayer will enter any soul that lifts itself even a little above the immediate present. 
A prayerful mood is when one looks up from the temporal nature of the transitory present to the eternal which embraces past, present and future. It is because it is so essential that we not only look beyond the present moment but also broaden our perceptions to experience it that Goethe gives to Faust the deeply significant words addressed to Mephistopheles, quote, If to the moment fleeting past, linger, I cry, thou art so fair, Close quote. which means if I were to be satisfied with living merely for the moment, quote, then in fetters you may bind me, let me perish for all I care. Close quote. One could also say, what Faust is crying out for is the power to pray so that he can escape from the clutches of his companion, Mephistopheles. The mood of prayer brings us, on the one hand, to look at our strictly limited ego, which has worked its way from the past into the present, and shows us clearly how very much more there is in us than we have put to use. And on the other hand, it brings us to look toward the future and show us how much more can flow from the future into our ego, than it has grasped so far. Any prayer belongs to one or other of these two categories. If we realize what our soul is expressing, then in the very prayer itself we shall find the strength that brings us beyond ourselves. For what else is prayer than the lighting up in us of the very force that seeks to transcend what our ego is at the moment? And if the ego is gripped by this striving, it already has, within it, the strength to progress. If the past has taught us that we have more within us than we have ever put to use, then prayer is a cry to the divine that it may fill us with its presence. When we have found our way to this knowledge with the feelings of our heart, we can count prayer among the forces that will aid the development of the ego. We can do the same with prayer directed toward the future. If we are anxious and afraid of the approaching future, we lack the attitude of submission that prayer can bring. We must never forget that our destiny is ordered by the wisdom of the world. A sincerely submissive mood works quite differently from anxiety and fear, for whereas these hinder our development, Submission enables us to approach the future with life-enhancing hope and an openness to receive it. So that submission, although it may seem to diminish us, is a powerful force carrying us toward the future, so that the future enriches our soul and raises our development to ever new heights. We have now grasped what an effective force prayer is, and realizing that this has the effect of promoting ego development we shall not need to expect any particular external effects, for we now know that prayer is itself a source of light and warmth, of light because we set the soul free in its relation to the future and dispose it to accept whatever may emerge from that unknown realm, or of warmth, because we recognize that although we failed in the past to bring the divine element to fruition in our ego, we have now brought it into our feelings so that it can be an effective force in us. Prayer that springs from looking back over the past gives rise to the inner warmth which is spoken of by all who understand prayer in its true nature. And the inner light comes to those who understand the submissive mood of prayer. From this point of view, it will not seem surprising that the great mystics found that devoting themselves to prayer was the best preparation for what they later sought for in mystical contemplation. Through prayer they brought their soul to the point where they were able to kindle the little spark within them. It is precisely through entering into the past that we are enabled to comprehend that wonderful feeling of intimacy that true prayer can bestow. Preoccupation with the external world estranges us from ourselves, just as in the past it prevented the more powerful element in us, the conscious ego, from emerging. We abandoned ourselves to outer impressions which scatter our thoughts and stop us concentrating, 
And this is what prevented the stronger divine power within us from unfolding. But now, if we allow it to unfold in the intimacy of prayer, we shall not be subject to the disintegrating effects of the outer world. It is this that fills one with the indescribably wonderful warmth of being in oneself, an inner bliss that can truly be called a divine warmth. And just as it is the warmth of the cosmos which appears physically as the inner warmth of higher beings, thus forming higher beings out of the lower ones that have the same warmth as their environment, just as it is this physical warmth which encloses a being materially within itself, It is the warmth of soul engendered by prayer that makes a being which loses itself in the outer world into a being enclosed in itself. While praying, we are warmed by the feeling of God. We not only feel the warmth, we also live intimately within ourselves. When, on the other hand, we approach the things of the outer world, they basically always appear to us intermingled with the unknown element of the future. For if you look closely enough, you will see that everything we confront in the outer world has something of the future in it. If we allow ourselves to be anxious and afraid, it is as though something were to push us away from it. The outer world becomes a dense veil. If, however, we can master a feeling of submission toward it, we shall then have feelings of hope and assurance. Whereas without these feelings only darkness comes toward us, a darkness that enters the feelings, with a feeling of submission we shall realize that the wisdom of the world will respond and light up only when the soul harbors the highest ideals. The prayerful mood of submission leads to hope of finding enlightenment from the environment. If in the darkness of night we feel abandoned, and pressed in on ourselves. When morning light breaks, we feel that we are set free, but not as though we were wanting to escape from ourselves, but as though we could now carry forth into the outer world our best desires and aspirations. Similarly, we can feel how surrender to the world, which estranges us from ourselves, is overcome by the warmth of prayer, which unites us with ourselves. And when we carry this warmth of prayer into the feeling of submission, it becomes light. And now, when we go out from ourselves, unite with the outer world and behold it, we no longer feel distracted and alienated, but feel that what is best in our soul flows out and unites us with the light that shines toward us from the outer world. These two modes of prayer are expressed better in images than in concepts. We can think, for instance, of the Old Testament story of Jacob and his soul-convulsing contest in the night. He appears to us as if we ourselves were abandoned to all the pressures of the world, where at first the soul is lost and cannot recover itself. When the striving to find ourselves begins, it sets off a conflict between our higher and our lower self. Emotions surge up and down, but with the help of prayer we work our way through until the moment finally comes and is prefigured in the story of Jacob where we are told that his night-long struggle is resolved and harmony reigns when the rising sun shines upon him. This is indeed what prayer can do for the soul. Seen in this light, prayer is free from all superstition for it brings out the best in us and works directly as a force in the soul. Prayer is thus preparatory to mystical contemplation, just as mystical contemplation is itself a preparation for what we know as spiritual research. Our discussion on prayer will have illustrated something often mentioned here, that we pile error upon error if we believe that we can find the divine element, our God, in a mystical way, only in ourselves. This mistake was of course often made in medieval times by mystics and other people who thought in a Christian way. It occurred because it was precisely in the Middle Ages that the practice of prayer began to be filled with egoism, 
the kind of egoism which impels the soul to tell itself that it wants to become more and more perfect and will think of nothing else but this. We can hear an echo of this egoistic desire when a misguided form of theosophy asserts that if only we turn aside from everything external, we can find God in ourselves. As we have seen, there are two modes of prayer, one leading to inner warmth and the other imbued with the feeling of submission toward the world, excuse me, a feeling of submission toward the future, leading out into the world again, and thus bringing illumination and true knowledge. Anyone who regards prayer in this light will soon see that the sort of knowledge acquired by ordinary intellectual methods is unproductive, but a certain aspect compared from a certain aspect compared to another kind. As we have seen, there are two modes of prayer, one leading to inner warmth and the other imbued with the feeling of submission toward the future, leading out into the world again, and thus bringing illumination and true knowledge. Anyone who regards prayer in this light will soon see that the sort of knowledge acquired by ordinary intellectual methods is unproductive from a certain aspect compared to another kind. Anyone who knows what prayer is will be familiar with that withdrawal of the soul into itself, where it frees itself from the disruptive multiplicity of the world and collects itself inwardly, and in this state of total attentiveness, remembers what is above the present moment and reaches into it from the past and the future. If we are acquainted with this mood, when in our whole environment there is neither sound nor sense impression, when only the finest thoughts and feelings of which we are capable are present to maintain our soul, when, perhaps, even these vanish, and only a fundamental feeling remains, pointing in two directions, to the God who announces himself from the past and toward the God who announces himself from the future. Then if we can hold this feeling, we will know that the soul experiences the kind of sublime moments when it realizes, quote, I have turned away from everything I can acquire through clever thinking, from everything I can pr produce through my feeling from all the ideals I can grasp in the way my will has been educated to grasp them. I have swept all of this away. I was devoted to my finest thoughts and feelings. Even these I have now banished and have kept only the fundamental feeling just described. Close quote. If we know this feeling, we know that in the same way as the wonders of nature meet us when we look at them with pure eyes, so do new feelings which we hitherto were unable to experience, shine into our soul. Impulses of will and ideals unknown to us before spring up in us, so that by way of this fundamental mood the most productive impulses awaken. Thus it is that prayer, in the best sense of the word, can give us a kind of wisdom beyond our immediate capacities. It can give us the possibility of feelings and perceptions that we have not managed to acquire before. And if prayer carries our self-education further, it can give us the strength of will to which we have not yet been able to rise. Certainly, if we are to attain to this, we shall have to make sure that it is the finest thoughts and the most beautiful feelings and impulses of which we are capable that come to life in our soul to produce such a result. And here we can only again and again call attention to the prayers that have been given to humankind on the most solemn occasions from earlier, earliest times. In my booklet titled The Lord's Prayer, you will find an account of the contents showing that its seven petitions embrace all the wisdom of the world. Now you might be inclined to say, quote, we are told in this booklet that the seven petitions can only be understood by someone who knows the deeper foundations of the universe. But simple, naive people, when they say this prayer, will obviously not be able to fathom these depths. Close quote. But it is not necessary that they should. For the Lord's Prayer to come into being, it was necessary that the words were drawn from an all-embracing wisdom of the universe and can be described, therefore, 
as containing the deepest secrets of humankind and of the macrocosm. And as these are contained in the Lord's Prayer, the very words are effective even in people who are far from being able to understand its depths. This is indeed the secret of a real prayer, that it has to have been drawn from cosmic wisdom. And because it has come from there, this is why it is effective, even if we do not as yet understand it. If we ascend to the higher stages for which prayer and mysticism are a preparation, then we shall be able to understand it. Prayer prepares us for mysticism, mysticism for meditation and concentration, and from that point we are directed to the actual work of spiritual research. To say that we must understand a prayer if it is to have a real effect is simply not true. Who understands the wisdom of a flower? Yet we can all take pleasure in it. Similarly, if cosmic wisdom has gone into the creation of a prayer, the prayer can pour its warmth and light into our soul without its secrets being grasped. However, unless it has been created out of wisdom, it will not have this power. The depth of wisdom in a prayer is shown us by its effectiveness. A real prayer has something to give to all of us, whatever stage of development we may have reached. And however high this stage may be, we shall never be, we shall never have exhausted a prayer, because it can always raise us to a still higher level. And the Lord's Prayer is one that need not only be used as a prayer, it can also call forth the mystic frame of mind, and it can be the subject of higher forms of meditation and concentration. This could also be said of some of the other prayers. Since the Middle Ages, however, something has come to the fore which we can only call egoism and which can have the effect of somewhat impairing the purity of prayer and its accompanying mood. If we make use of prayer for the purpose only of withdrawing into ourselves and making ourselves more perfect, as many Christians did during the Middle Ages, and perhaps still do today. And we fail to look out also at the world around us with whatever illumination we have received. And prayer will succeed only in separating us from the world and making us feel like strangers in it. That often happened to those who used prayer in connection with false asceticism and solitude, these people wished to be perfect, not only in the sense of the rose which adorns itself in order to add beauty to the garden, but on their own account, so as to find blessedness within their own souls. Those who seek for their God in their soul and refuse to take what they have gained out into the world will find that their refusal turns back on them and takes its revenge. Indeed, there are various writings by mystics who have known only the prayer that gives inner warmth. Even the text by Miguel de Melinos, in which you will find some strange descriptions of all kinds of passions and urges, temptations and attacks and violent cravings, which these souls experienced just in those cases of seeking perfection through abandonment to what the particular individual takes to be his God. If I look back over the past with feelings of regret and shame and tell myself that there is something great in me which I have never allowed full scope, but which I will now open myself to so that I shall become perfect, then in a certain way this atmosphere of perfection does arise. But the imperfect part of myself turns into a counterforce and lashes out all the more strongly in the form of temptations and passions. But as soon as the soul recollects itself in inner warmth and devotion, seeks for God in all the works in which he is revealed, and strives for illumination, it soon will of itself break away from the narrow, selfish ego, and the storms of passion will be stilled and receive healing. 
This is why it is so bad to allow egoism to find its way into mystical withdrawal and meditation. If we wish to find God, but wish this only in order to keep Him in our own souls, this shows that our egoism has, in an unhealthy way, crept into our highest endeavors. Then this egoism will have its revenge on us. We shall be healed only if, after having found God within us, we pour what we now have in us unselfishly into the world, through our thoughts, our feelings, and our will and actions. We often hear today, especially in the realm of wrongly understood theosophy, and warnings against this can never be given often enough, that you cannot find God in the outer world. God lives within you yourself. Enter right into yourself and you will find God. I once even heard someone who liked flattering his audience say, quote, You do not need to learn or experience anything to do with the great mysteries of the universe. You need only look within yourselves, and there you will find God. Close quote. There is, however, something else which must be considered in conjunction with this if we are to arrive at the truth. A medieval thinker found the right thing to say regarding this attitude, which is right if kept within its rightful limits. We must never forget that it is not untruths that do most harm, for the soul will soon detect them. Much worse are statements which are true under certain circumstances, but quite wrong if misapplied. In a certain sense, it is true to say that we have to seek God within ourselves. But just because this is true, it is all the more harmful if it is not kept within the necessary bounds. A medieval thinker said, quote, Who would look for a tool everywhere he possibly could look outside the house when he knows very well that it is in the house? If he did so, he would be a fool. But it is just as foolish to look all over the place outside for a tool, an instrument, with which to acquire knowledge of God when it is, quote, at home, close quote, in his own soul, close quote. But please note that the word he uses is tool, instrument. It is not God himself that one should look for in one's own soul. God is sought by means of an instrument, and this instrument will not be found anywhere outside. This has to be looked for in the soul, by means of true prayer, mystical withdrawal, meditation and concentration at the various stages. And it is with the aid of this instrument that we must approach the earthly realms. Then we shall find God everywhere. For he reveals himself, once one has the instrument to find him, in all the earthly realms and at all levels of existence. So we must look in ourselves for the necessary instrument, and then with its aid we shall find God everywhere. Observations such as these on the nature of prayer are not popular today. How on earth, people say, can prayer change anything, whatever we ask for? The course of the world follows inevitable laws, and we cannot change them. But if we really want to discover the nature of a powerful force, we have to look for it where it is at home. Today we have sought for the power of prayer in the human soul, and we found that it was something that brings the soul forward. And those who know that what is effective in the world is spirit, not an imaginary abstract spirit, but actual active spirit, and that the human soul belongs to the reality of the spirit, will also know that not only material forces following unalterable laws, are at work in the world, but that spiritual beings, spiritual forces are also at work, even when the effects of these are not visible to the outer eye and to external science. E.Y.E. So if we strengthen our spiritual life through prayer, we need only wait for the results. They will come. But the effects of prayer in the outer world will be looked for only by those who have first recognized the reality of the power of prayer. Those who do recognize this might try the following experiment. 
Let them look back over a period of ten years, during which they scorned prayer, and then over a second period of ten years, during which they recognized its power. If they then compare the two periods, they will see that the course of their lives changed under the influence of the forces that enlivened their souls through prayer. Forces can be seen through their effects. It is easy to deny the existence of forces if one does nothing to activate them. What right do people have to deny the power of prayer if they have never tried to bring it to effect in themselves? It is only by putting a force to use that we shall discover its effect. I have to admit that the time is not yet ripe for going into the wider effects of prayer, however unbiased the discussion might be. The idea that a congregational prayer, in which the forces of all the participants combine, has a heightened spiritual power and is therefore more real, that is outside the grasp of ordinary thinking today. So we must rest content with the aspect we have been studying today regarding the power of prayer, and that, and that is actually enough. For those who have a fair understanding of it will certainly not be put off by hearing the kind of objections to prayer that are so easily advanced nowadays. What form do these objections take? Various forms. For example, we are told that if we think of an active person who is engaged all the time in helping others, and compare him with someone who withdraws quietly into himself and activates his soul forces in prayer, we shall probably think of the latter as lazy compared to the first one. Please pardon me if I say, out of a certain feeling for spiritual scientific knowledge, that another point of view exists. I will put it in a rather whimsical way, but it is not unfounded. Undoubtedly there are people, those familiar with the underlying threads in life, who will maintain that many a writer of leading articles in newspapers would be rendering a better service to their fellows if they were to pray and work on the improvement of their own souls, far-fetched as this may sound. Would that more people could be persuaded that it is more sensible to pray than to write articles. The same could be said of other intellectual occupations, especially the very modern ones. But the force that works through prayer is essential too for an understanding of the whole of human life. And this is seen with a special clarity if we look at particular aspects of the deeper side of cultural life. Who could fail to recognize that prayer, not in a one-sided egoistic way, but in the more comprehensive manner in which we have dealt with it today, is a constituent of art? There are, of course, other moods included in art, such as comedy, a humorous approach which raises itself above what it portrays. But there is also such things as odes and hymns, which have a prayer-like character. And even in the realm of painting there are examples of what could be called prayers in paint. And who would deny that a magnificent, gigantic cathedral is like a solidified prayer reaching up to heaven? If we are able to see these things in the context of life, then we shall recognize that prayer, seen in its true nature, is one of the things that lead human beings out of a finite and transient world into the realm of the eternal. This was especially felt by those who found their way from prayer to mysticism, as did Angela Silesius, whom I mentioned today and also in the previous lecture. He felt that he owed the quality of his mystical thoughts, their profound truth, their sublime beauty, their heartwarming sincerity and shining clarity, as seen, for example, in titled The Cherubinian Traveler, to the preparatory practice of prayer which had had such a powerful effect on his soul. And what is the fundamental nature of the forces that permeates and illuminates the kind of mysticism practiced by Angela Silesius. What is it other than a mood of eternity for which prayer has prepared them? Everyone who prays can have some intimation of this mood when through prayer they reach true inner peace, inner warmth, and through these liberation from themselves. 
a mood enabling them to look beyond the passing moment to eternity, brings together in their souls a joining up of past, present, and future. When we turn in prayer to those aspects of life where we seek for God, then, whether we are aware of it or not, the feelings, thoughts, and words that enter into our praying will be permeated by the mood of eternity, which lives in these beautiful lines of Angela Silesius. They make a fitting conclusion to today's thoughts, for they can bring to every true prayer, even if unconsciously, something like a divine aroma of sweetness. Quote, Forsaking time, I am myself eternity. Then I am one with God, God one with me. Close quote. 